In this lecture, we're going to derive the frequency response of an LTI system that has been described by its differential equation. This is part of a larger uh, series of lectures covering continuous time LTI systems. There's a set of notes that I'm going to be referring to which is available online. Look for a, a pop-up with a link or a link in the description of this video. And uh, the uh, scope of what is covered in this set of notes is, uh, is depicted by this diagram uh, on page one of the notes. Uh, a linear time invariant system can be described in, uh, we'll, we'll look at its description in three different time domain representations. The first is the differential equation. Uh, the second is the impulse response and then using convolution to predict the response of the system using the impulse response and a given uh, input. The third is the state variable representation. And then all of these can be uh, used to describe the system's frequency response. So at this point in the uh, notes and in the course we have described the system by its uh, linear differential equation and now we're going to move from there and describe its frequency response. So I'm on page 12 here. One of the things that we had found um, that was characteristic of an LTI system is that if you excite an LTI system with uh, a function, time domain function, of the form e to the st, where s is either a real or, or um, complex constant, the response of the system, the steady state response, steady state response of the system will also be of the same form but scaled by some constant lambda. And uh, this is the definition of uh, or characteristic of an eigenfunction of a system. If you, if, if a system transforms a function and the, response, the result of that transformation is that same function but scaled and that function is an eigenfunction. And for LTI systems the response to an e to the st excitation will always be e to the st um, but simply scaled by lambda. Okay, and this is, uh, as you'll see, this lambda is, is something that is introduced as early as uh, like a first circuits course when you're doing uh, AC analysis doing phasers, uh, that lambda turns out to be a complex quantity, the magnitude of which is, uh, is the scaling of the amplitude of the e to the st function and the, um, the angle uh, of, of lambda, if you put it in polar form, is actually the shift, the, the phase shift of the input as it passes through um, the system and comes out on the output. So. Um, we, the reason that we're looking at e to the st uh, is that we're actually, by, by considering frequency response, we're, we're saying if we excite a system with sinusoidal signals, what kind of sinusoidal response do we have? So we're going to be exciting the system with sines and cosines. Okay, and those can be um, constructed using complex exponentials. So as you uh, will recall, cosine omega t is simply one half e to the j or i uh, omega t plus e to the minus j omega t. All right? And the sine is uh, the difference of those two over 2j. So when we excite a system with e to the st, uh, functional form that includes uh, exciting the system with sinusoids and so <clears throat> that's why we're going to use uh, the EDST uh, as part of our frequency response uh, analysis or derivation so let me go uh, scroll down here and uh, we will uh, actually use a different notation um, than lambda uh, when we apply an e to the st, we will have a response that we're going to call h 
of s e to the st. h of s is just another symbol for lambda. We will see that it's also simply the transfer function of the LTI system. Lambda is definitely a function of s, and we will see that here shortly. And so when we uh, talk about the frequency response, it's a special case of an e to the st excitation. It's an e to the st excitation where s is actually uh, equal to j omega. It's purely imaginary. Again, because frequency response has to do with sinusoidal excitation. So we need those imaginary values of s. So we will refer to h of s as the system transfer function, and we will refer to h of j omega as the system frequency response. So the difference being that uh, h of j omega is more specific. We will have plugged in j omega for s. So let's return to our um, differential equation representation. We use the operator form, linear operator form, capital L operating on Y. All that is our uh, weighted sum of uh, derivative terms. So what we have is if we have an nth order uh, differential equation, we, might, we would have B sub N times capital D N to the N, where, where capital D is just defined as D dt. Okay, so this differential equation is b sub n, the nth derivative of y plus b sub n minus 1, the nth minus 1 derivative of y, etc. And on the right, in general, we could have also weighted, um, weighted sum of uh, powers of the derivative of u of t, <clears throat> and there we use a. You might notice that um, here we have b1, but we don't have b0, we have 1. Whereas on the right we have a1, and then we do have a0. This is a choice and convention. One could uh, replace 1 with b0 and replace a0 with 1. But one or the other should be set to 1, because uh, otherwise it's a redundant uh, description. In other words, we only need uh, m, let's see, it would be uh, m plus n plus 1 coefficients uh, to describe uniquely a system. We don't need m plus n plus 2. So that we may point that out more and, or clarify that in some examples. So the uh, deriv deriving the frequency response is very straightforward and uh, simple to do. All we're going to do is we're going to basically plug in uh, our excitation e to the st, we're going to plug that in to u of t, and we're going to claim, because we claim we know from an LTI system that the response to e to the st will be a scaled version of e to the st, we'll plug h of s e to the st into y, and then we'll actually operate on those solutions with, um, with the linear operator L. So for instance, the first term uh, will be the first term would be b sub n times h of s times the nth derivative of e to the st. So the nth derivative of e to the st will pull out an s to the n e to the st. And if we take the b sub n and the s to the n, that is what actually ultimately ends up right here. So there's some algebra, but um, uh, it's very straightforward, and we can solve for the transfer function h of s as simply being a ratio of uh, really the LD, the, op the driving operator on the right, where all of the uh, differential operators d have been replaced with uh, s, and divided by uh, the denominator, which is comprised of the uh, linear operator L, where uh, the derivative operator D is replaced with S. And then for the frequency response, we're simply going to replace S with J omega, and that's what we have here. Now, you might be wondering why are we looking at E to the ST? That's a, <clears throat> that's a complex uh, <clears throat> signal, 
and we're after all interested in real signals like I want to apply a sine omega t or cosine omega t to the system so how does this help us well <clears throat> we can take the results from an e to the st excitation and um, extract from that the real part to actually consider or determine what the response is to a real sinusoidal excitation. Let me show you that. So u, to, u of t is equal to the e to the j omega t. And <clears throat> if, we, if we redefine u of t to be the real part of e to the j omega t, then uh, by Euler's formula, right, e to the j omega t is equal to cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. So if we take the real part of this complex exponential, it, um, it pulls out simply the cosine omega t. So the question is, um, if, if we, ca can we, can we uh, assume that if the excitation is not e to the st, but the real part of e to the, or not e to the j omega t, but the, the real part of e to the j omega t, can we assume that the response is going to be the real part of h of j omega times e to the j omega t. And uh, that is what uh, we show right here. So y of d, the uh, steady state or driven response, is going to be the real part of h of j omega e to the j omega t. and so we can put this uh, h of j omega into polar form, so it's got a magnitude and an angle. We'll add the argument of h of j omega t with omega t here, and then we'll take the real part of that, and the real part will be cosine omega t plus this angle, call it theta, the argument of h of j omega t. So. A sinusoidal input to an LTI system is simply the same sinusoidal shifted in phase by argument or the angle of h of j omega and scaled in amplitude by h of j omega. So if we have a cosine omega t that is exciting our system, and I will just represent the system as h of s now, but it's an LTI system, then the response is going to be magnitude of h of j omega times, I can't fit it here, times cosine omega t plus the angle or argument of h of j omega. So here's an example from uh, circuits domain. So we have a RC circuit driven by a voltage, I call it x, and we have an output y. So the differential equation that describes this is uh, the forcing function x of t is equal to rc uh, times the derivative of y plus y. The linear operator l is going to be l plus 1 operating on y, and the forcing function in this case is 3 sine of 10t. <clears throat> Using our result from the previous page, let me go up, uh, I'm describing the function, the, the uh, frequency response right here. Okay, we can by inspection write the transfer function for our system here. So the coefficients of L go down in the denominator of the transfer function. And the coefficients of LD go into the numerator. In this case, it's trivial. It's just simply 1 times u. In the denominator, we have 1 plus 1 times uh, s. And we're going to replace that with j omega. So that's our transfer function. It's actually our frequency response, because we've, we've replaced s with j omega. And now all we need to do is uh, calculate h of j omega for omega equal to 10, because that is what we are exciting the system with. We end up with 1 over 1 plus j10. We take the magnitude of 1 plus 10j, and uh, 
the, uh, the angle of that. Turns out the angle is going to be the arctan of the imaginary part over the real part, but because that's in the denominator, when we move it up to the numerator, there's a minus sign that shows up. So the result is that h of j10 is equal to approximately 0.1 magnitude with an angle of minus 84.3 degrees. That gives us a response y of t that is equal to um, 0.3 times cosine of 10t with the phase shift of minus 84.3. So the signal is attenuated and uh, it is lagging. Now if we were to plot h of j omega magnitude versus omega and we plotted that on a log scale we would find that uh, we have essentially a first order low pass filter where below an, an omega of around 1 okay that that corresponds to this one here um, or I should say maybe I should say it's actually corresponding to I could write this as over one okay it's that one right there for frequencies well below that um, that value of one the transfer function has a magnitude of approximately one but as omega increases far beyond an omega of one uh, this term here takes over and grows much larger than the one that it's added to and now you get a minus one slope and you start attenuating. We're exciting the system at this point uh, for this example at 10 so you can see it we're operating right here which is approximately uh, about we're, we're one decade above that corner frequency of one and so we're approximately one tenth one tenth of the input magnitude. As a final note, when you are uh, evaluating the magnitude or the angle of h of j omega, it's helpful to uh, recognize the following uh, following rules, I guess. Um, so h of j omega is always going to be a ratio of two polynomials in j omega or in s, right? And so there's going to be an enumerator n of s, n of j omega, and a denominator d. Of j omega. So the magnitude of the overall uh, transfer function is simply going to be the magnitude of the numerator divided by the magnitude of the denominator. So you can evaluate the magnitude of the numerator separate from that of the denominator. You don't have to handle the whole thing altogether. In addition, if, if n or d are factored, say s plus 3 times s plus 2, Right, you can take the magnitude of j omega plus 3 times the magnitude of j omega plus 2. You don't have to uh, expand that into a quadratic term and then uh, you know, substitute j omega and then find the magnitude. It's much easier to leave it factored. Similarly with angle, when you're trying to find the overall angle of h of j omega, uh, the, the, total, the net angle of h of j omega is equal to the angle of the numerator minus the angle of the denominator. And furthermore, if you have a term like, again, like s plus 3 and s plus 2 in the, in the numerator or in the denominator, you could say the angle of the numerator would be equal to the angle of j plus 3 plus the angle of j omega plus 2. In other words, you don't have to expand that term and then try to take the angle of the whole numerator all at once. So it actually makes the evaluation of the magnitude and angle of h of j omega uh, much easier to do.